Down this among the belongings. At my grandson's funeral, who passed away from heart disease, a small envelope was handed to me and on the front, in clumsy writing, was Will. With hesitation, I opened it and found it filled with words of gratitude for his mom and grandma. I continued to read through tears. However, the ending was a shocking revelation. No, everything written there is a lie, nonsense. A man cried out in panic. The man's lies, revealed by the will, were met with jeers from those around. My name is Margaret. I lost my husband a few years ago, and now I live with my only son, John, his wife Emily, and my grandson, Alex. Grandma, I'm home. Welcome back. Go wash your hands, I've prepared some snacks. Since both are working, I take care of Alex after school. John works at a big corporation and has busy days. Emily finishes her part-time job in the afternoon and helps me prepare dinner every day. Today, while we were cooking, I noticed Alex watching TV in the living room looking pale. Hey Alex, are you feeling okay? Emily rushed over worriedly, and Alex nodded slightly. Um, I feel a bit of pain in my chest. A bad feeling struck me as Alex held his chest and tilted his head. Emily, I'm concerned. Maybe we should take him to the doctor tomorrow. Yes, we should. Alex, let's skip school tomorrow and visit the doctor. When John came home, I told him about Alex's chest pain, but he dismissed it with a laugh, saying it was an exaggeration. I often get chest or stomach pains too. Probably just hurt himself playing. You and Emily are such worry warts. His somewhat callous words made me realize what a father he was. Despite what John said, Emily and I couldn't ignore Alex's ongoing pale complexion and pain. The next day, we made an appointment and visited the nearby clinic. It could be a serious illness. I'll write a referral, so get it checked out at another hospital right away. At the university hospital they were referred to, Alex underwent a detailed examination of his chest and was diagnosed with severe heart disease. He was given a year to live, and hearing this, my world turned pitch black. He's just in elementary school. How could this happen? After that, Emily took a leave from work and started taking turns with me to accompany Alex at the hospital. In contrast, John showed concern for Alex's health, but often came home late due to busy work periods. Sometimes he would be away on business trips for days. Normally, one would expect a father to make time after hearing his son has only a short time left but John showed no sign of doing so. When he did come home, he often yelled at his wife, Emily, in a condescending tone. Hey, isn't dinner ready yet? What a drag. I'm tired from work, so hurry up. Yes. Emily, possibly worn out from caregiving, seemed much thinner than before. John, oblivious to this, and instead of being understanding, became nastily critical over minor issues. Despite taking turns at the hospital, household tasks inevitably suffered. Unable to prepare food in advance for the unpredictable John, a simple meal would infuriate him. Watch this easy cooking. Can't you make something decent when you're at home all day? 
What's the point of taking time off work? Hey, there's no need to talk like that. Taking leave wasn't for housework, it was for Alex's care. It's okay, Margaret, John is probably just tired from work. But that's no excuse to talk like that. Duh, great, I come home to this. If the meal's bad, at least give me a massage to show some appreciation. You really don't get it, do you? John's commanding demeanor seemed like a different person from before. He wasn't like this as a child. What happened to him? He might be stressed from work and his son's illness. But we're stressed too. In fact, we have to watch Alex's condition worsen day by day, which weighs even heavier on us. Hey John, why don't you show more concern for Alex? You're all about work and hardly visit the hospital and be a bit nicer to Emily. Duh, even you, mom. Of course, I'm worried about my son. But if Emily isn't working, who's going to pay the hospital bills? We, both Emily and I, were left speechless by John's dismissive response. As dissatisfaction with her son's behavior grew, Alex celebrated his eighth birthday. Though he wasn't allowed to go home, a modest party was held in his hospital room. Happy birthday, Alex. You've done so well with your medication and treatments every day. Here's your gift. I handed Alex a large gift box, but his expression was gloomy. Thank you. But where's dad? Why doesn't he ever come to see me? I thought he would at least come today. Alex whispered sadly, his face pale. Of course, I had informed John about today's birthday party well in advance. Ah, uh, I have a business trip that day. I'll buy a gift. Just give it to him. Don't be ridiculous. Your own son is suffering from illness. Frustrated by his blatant indifference, Emily finally lost her temper and knelt at John. Not this again. Uck, this is depressing. I'm not coming home today. With a sullen look, John quickly left the house. I was fed up with my son. He would flee whenever things got tough. A few days after the birthday party, we were called by Alex's primary doctor. His condition is worsening. Please make as many memories as you can with him now. He doesn't have much longer. In front of the somber-faced doctor, we broke down in tears. We immediately informed John over the phone about this reality. Perhaps finally affected by his sin's condition. He rushed to the hospital that day. Alex seemed happy to see his father after such a long time. However, the words John spoke to his son were incredibly thoughtless. It's been a while, Dad's here. Hang in there. It'll be over soon. I'm going to miss you when you're gone. Thinking he was being encouraging, John's words were so harsh that Emily and I quickly intervened. Hey, that's no way to speak. Enough, just leave now. We escorted John out of the hospital room, crying. John laughed, saying it's just a joke, but his insensitive words were unforgivable. Alex looked stunned by his father's words. Doesn't dad care if I'm gone? I hugged him, assuring him that wasn't true. However, John's behavior made it clear that he likely had little love left for Alex. After some time, Alex got permission for his first overnight stay at home. Home is really the best. In front of Alex, Hugh said joyfully, 
Emily and I made sure to keep our sadness hidden, acting cheerfully. I wanted to make as many happy memories as possible for him until the end, that's what I fought. However, John's lifestyle didn't change at all, even with his son back home. He seemed to somewhat restrain himself from being harsh to Emily in front of Alex, but he still returned home late and frequently went on business trips. Since that day he spoke thoughtlessly, Alex had been avoiding his father. John, even at home, appeared distracted, constantly on his smartphone. When he received phone calls, he would sneak out to talk. Peeking at him, I saw a sloppiness in his expression that I had never seen before. John, who are you talking to? Ah, uh, just, work calls. But you didn't used to get calls every day like this. Stop nagging me. It's a busy period, and I have a lot to handle. His suspicious behavior was too much, but he always evaded my questions. After the homestay, Alex returned to the hospital. He then said he wanted to talk to his father alone. Despite John's terrible behavior, Alex still missed his father. Touched by his request, Emily and I agreed to let them talk privately. When I told John, he looked annoyed, but he couldn't dismiss his sin's dying wish and visited the hospital room. I was curious about their conversation, but we left the room, letting John take our place. This was because Alex had previously told us he wanted to have a man-to-man -man talk and asked us to leave the room when John arrived. I wonder if it's okay. What if he says something thoughtless again? Yes, and Alex wanting to talk to his dad. What are they discussing? With these concerns, Emily and I waited in the hospital's waiting room. After about 30 minutes, John finally came out of the hospital room. Man, that kid is something else. He's got a good eye. He muttered in a strangely good mood as soon as he left the room. I couldn't understand the meaning of his words. Yet, John's face bore the same sloppy, lax expression as when he was on that phone call. Alex's condition had been stable for a while, but suddenly we received a call from the hospital about a critical change. Emily and I rushed to the hospital. I tried to contact John on the way, but couldn't reach him at all. It seemed he had turned off his phone. By the time Emily and I arrived at the hospital, Alex had already passed away. Alex, why? Don't leave me behind. Emily sobbed, clinging to Alex, who lay still on the bed. I stood there, dumbstruck, staring at the scene. Why did an eight-year-old child have to die? We never heard from John that day. I wondered where he was and what he was doing, knowing his son had died. I no longer had the energy to be angry. The next day, as Emily and I were preparing for the visitation, John finally returned, saying he had to leave soon for an important business trip. I couldn't believe his nerve, prioritizing work over his son's funeral. What are you thinking? Your son has died. Um, I feel bad about it, too. But I can't just leave a gap in my work. No matter how much we pressed, John seemed distant and eventually left as he was. During the visitation, I stared at Alex's face in the coffin, motionless. Now, I just want to send Alex peacefully to heaven. 
Despite the sudden notice, many relatives came to say goodbye at the funeral the next day. Among them, my brother, Sam, who had adored Alex dearly in life, was deeply saddened. Margaret, you've been so strong. It must have been tough. My brother said, comforting me, before suddenly looking around, as if he noticed something was off. But why isn't John, the father, here at this place? He had to go on a business trip. At that, my brother, Sam, instantly looked stern. His own son has died and he's off on business. What is he thinking? Angry, Sam grabbed his smartphone and started making a call. Hey John, where are you? Is work more important than your son's funeral? His angry shout echoed through the funeral home. No, that's not it. I told Emily and Mom I'd be late to the funeral. John replied, making excuses, but of course, Emily and I hadn't heard anything like that. Stop the nonsense and come here now. John, he was always intimidated by Sam, arrived at the funeral home a few hours later, likely spurred by the scolding. When John arrived late, he was met with cold stares from us and the other relatives. I thought he might behave quietly due to the awkwardness, but John sneaked out even during the funeral preparations. I was furious with my son. He was supposed to be the organizer for his son's funeral, but was absent-minded. Following him, I caught him on his phone, having a conversation. Who would contact him during his child's funeral? I eavesdropped quietly. Sorry for the change of plans. I'll make it up next time. Yay, I want to see you soon too. He said lightheartedly, not sounding like a bereaved father. What's going on? Who is he talking to? Yeah, now that the nuisance is gone, we can finally be free. Let's be together as soon as I get a divorce. I love you. The phrase nuisance is gone was shocking to hear. I hurried back to my spot, careful not to reveal I had overheard him. From his words, it was probably a woman he was speaking to. The thought of the worst possible scenario made me feel sick. I hope I'm wrong, but if this suspicion is true, I cannot forgive him, even if he is my son. That's what I thought. After the funeral, we served food to the gathered relatives and mourners in the large hall. John, who had cruelly seemed pleased about his own son's death, was there too, looking unfazed. Everyone was in a somber mood, reminiscing about John when Emily returned after stepping out for a moment. Margaret, please look at this. I found it while sorting through Alex's belongings. She said with a puzzled look, handing me a small envelope. It appeared to have come from a treasure box Alex cherished. The envelope was clumsily labeled Will in a child's handwriting. I was struck by the word. To think that an eight-year-old child had contemplated his own mortality and written a message for someone after his death. The thought was heart-wrenching, and tears flowed again. Taking it from Emily, I read it aloud in front of the family. Alex's will first expressed gratitude to Emily and me. He wrote about how happy he was that we visited him in the hospital every day, and although his illness was painful, he was able to endure because we were there. Emily was sobbing. 
I continued reading through tears. There was no mention of gratitude toward John, but towards the end, the will finally addressed Dad. What is this? What's going on? It revealed John had been having an affair with a younger woman for years. Here's how Alex found out about the affair. Alex came to know about the affair before his heart condition was discovered, when John was in the bath and his phone rang. John answered it innocently and heard a young woman's voice calling John's name, saying I love you, I want to see you again, and mentioning she was waiting for the day he would leave his wife. At the time, Alex didn't understand, but as he grew older, he realized that it might have been John's mistress on the phone. Dad, I know. You're meeting another woman, aren't you? On the day Alex had us leave the room to talk man to man with John, he confronted his father about the call, the woman's voice, and her words of love. John panicked when his affair was mentioned. What are you talking about? It's okay, you don't have to hide it. You're quite popular, huh? I kind of admire that. What's she like? I want to see her. Initially wary of being exposed, John relaxed when he realized Alex wasn't threatening to reveal the affair and began talking about his mistress cheerfully. There are many photos of her on Dad's phone. Check them. They are the proof. The will concluded. What the? Sam exclaimed in disbelief. All the relatives were murmuring. John, panicked, tried to flee, but Sam forcefully grabbed his shoulder and snatched the smartphone from his hand. Give it back. It's all lies. Are you going to believe a child? We'll see if it's lies once we look at this. Sam retorted coldly to the flustered John. After accessing the phone, Sam sighed heavily. Take a look at this. And then showed us the screen. There were numerous photos of John intimately with a young woman just as Alex had written in his will. Some images were too compromising to be dismissed as mere friendship. John had indeed been meeting this woman, lying about working instead of seeing his sick son. You were talking to this woman on the phone earlier, right? I heard everything. The nuisance is gone, you said. Learning that John had indeed referred to Alex as a nuisance fueled my anger. Unforgivable, to cheat and then trample so thoroughly on the hearts of me and Alex. The family surrounding John began to hurl insults at him. His pale face made excuses, but no one was willing to listen. I had been planning to leave Emily even before we knew about Alex's illness. Then we found out about it. Wouldn't my reputation have suffered if I had left you all then? I'm the one who's been paying the hospital bills. Isn't that enough? His outrageous words nearly made my blood vessels burst in anger. Shut up, always thinking about yourself. It should have been you in that coffin. Later, everyone present became witnesses, and with the undeniable evidence from the smartphone data, John and Emily proceeded with the divorce. It's your fault for always caring for Alex and neglecting me. John continued with his absurd excuses, prompting Emily to demand a significant amount in alimony through her lawyer. Despite him being my own son, my patience had run out, and I severed ties with John. After being kicked out of our home, John tried to move in with his mistress. But in reality, 
His mistress was an industrial spy aiming to steal secrets from his major corporation. John, while dating her, had carelessly talked about critical confidential information. Of course, the woman had no intention of staying with him and easily discarded him once she got what she needed. Following the leak of information to a rival company, John was fired for his role in the breach. Conversely, Emily, though initially shattered by Alex's loss, recently returned to her job, revitalized. Alex would laugh if he saw his mom forever sad. She said with a resolved smile. Using the grief of losing Alex as a driving force, she seems to be even more dedicated to her work than before. After being dumped by his mistress and disowned, John came to me for help. Since I had been blocking his calls, he came to the house, but I turned him away at the gate. Please, Mom, I have no one else. After what you've done to Alex and Emily, you dare ask this, never cross our threshold again, you're no longer my son to me. John apologized, crying, but I could never forgive him for Alex's sake. Margaret, over here. Emily waved me over at the coffee shop where we met. Even after the divorce from John, we continued to meet frequently for coffee and outings. Years later, as we had coffee. I have good news to share. I have a feeling there's some good news coming. I've been focusing on my work since Alex passed away, and because of my performance, I've become the first female executive at my company. Congratulations. That's wonderful news for Alex to hear. I think she really worked hard, being the first woman to reach a management position at her company. Later, we plan to visit Alex's grave, still mourning his loss, yet determined to live our lives in a way that would make him proud.